I'm going to go over just a few of the new treatments in cornea and refractive surgery here. So the first thing that we've started doing at the Moran also is corneal cross-linking. And so uh, I think Julie's going to talk, Julie is going to talk a little bit more about this, but I'll, I'll just be brief on this one. So this uses UV light and riboflavin <laughs> photosensitizer to strengthen chemical bonds in the cornea, and it was FDA approved this year for use in keratoconus with the Avidro system. Um, and this, the approved treatment is an epithelium off treatment, so we strip the epithelium off and then apply riboflavin for 30 minutes and then do a UV application for 30 minutes for keratoconus. Um, there are a few things that, this has been done for quite a while outside of the U.S., and, and so some of the future applications that, that we may be doing are for pellucid marginal generation, for ectasia after refractive surgery, tarians, um, and after cross-linking, it's possible that we may be able to do refractive surgery like PRK on keratoconus patients, and some people are doing this already even in the U.S., um, a couple other interesting treatments that are done outside of the U.S. are PIXEL, which is a refractive procedure that uses these apertures. These apertures, like you can see over here, to selectively cross-link parts of the cornea as a, as a primary refractive procedure. Um, and then there's also LASIK Extra, which has done, been done pretty extensively outside of the U.S., where after lifting the stromal flap, f or lifting the flap um, for la in LASIK surgery, that cross-linking is ap applied briefly to the stromal bed in, in order to provide better stability in patients that may be at risk for regression after refractive surgery. They're doing that after the ablation? Um, before the ablation, yes, well, but after a lifting of the flap. After. Yeah, actually, I... Yeah. I think the, the people who are most cautious are actually... I mean, there are people doing it with LASIK, but most people are doing PRK actually. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you can have LASIK or PRK extra. But there have been about 100,000 cases done outside of the U.S. Yeah, we we started recently, but we have a list of people that we're we're going to yeah, offer we, it to. We were in the FDA trial or one of the trials for the rapid cross-linking. What was approved by the FDA is a 30-minute standard kind of Dresden protocol, which is what we have to do now. But we treated about I think 40 or 50 patients, and we treated as young as 12 and as old as you know into the 50s. But I don't think it works very well. Post-LASIK, Octasia, at least in our experience, but it works quite, you know, it's, it's a good adjunctive treatment for young care of those patients who are progressing. We don't want to still do it this time. <laughs> <laughs> so just reiterate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, there, there are some case reports of this that are, were, there are a couple case reports from Mexico, and I think there was one from <coughs> Spain also where they, they showed um, afterward that they were able to eradicate it, even acanthamoeba from the cornea using cross-linking. But, I, you know, it hasn't really, we don't have any controlled studies of that yet. Is that approved? I mean, could you do that if you wanted to? Not, a, no, not approved. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and I 
we have some results from the symphonies that have been done here from Dr. Crandall too, so I'll be quick on this one also. But um, the symphony, the symphony toric lens is a new lens that's available recently, and it's and it, it's different than the other AMO, AMO multifocals. It has an extended range of vision, IOL. Um, both toric and non-toric versions are available, and it uses this diffractive echelette to provide an elongated focal area. Um, so it basically has a larger defocus curve. You can see that in the, in the graph down here. So it supposedly is providing quality vision for up to the intermediate range. And you would expect that patients would need to use reading glasses still with this lens. But um, down in the bottom right here, you can see that monofocal has a single focal point. Of course, multifocal has two. And then this has this elongated focal point. I mean, we can talk a little bit later about the results from the Moran so far with this lens. So another of the big drugs that is out now for cornea is, is Zydra, Lefitigras 5% ophthalmic solution. Um, they have a not so modest advertising campaign, so probably a lot of people have heard about this. Um, so it's the first drug in 13 years that's approved for dry eye, both for signs and symptoms of dry eye. It's a two time a day drop. And the, the mechanism, or at least in vitro mechanism, is um, it binds LFA1 receptor on T cells and blocks the ICAM1 LFA1 binding. Um, and in vitro studies, this prevented T cell adhesion and pro-inflammatory cytokine release. And there's a thought that the ICAM is upregulated in patients that have dry eye on their ocular surface. And so they did, in the clinical trials for Zydra, they did four separate studies, both looking at the signs and looking at the symptoms. When they were looking at the symptoms, the results looked a little bit better with these studies when they compared the vehicle to the drug. Um, and they showed improvement on this 100-point dryness score um, in all four studies over a period of several months. The, for the signs of dry eye, those, are, those results were pretty close together, actually, I think, for the drug compared to the vehicle. But there was improvement in the four studies. And the side effects are pretty similar with Zydra compared to Restasis, um, burning or insulation, site irritation some decreased vision and um, eye redness. But probably the most prominent difference is that a lot of people have bad taste with this drug, and it's, it's not always a mild side effect either. And some, some patients are saying that this, even though the company says it lasts for 15 minutes, some patients say that it can last for hours that they have this bad taste in their mouth. Um, but Dr. Lynn and I have used it in a number of patients so far, and we've noticed that some people that don't get any benefit from a stasis, that they have said that this has been pretty helpful for them. Um, and also, it seems like it may be taking effect more quickly than the typical three to four months that it takes to get the full benefit from restasis. But those are just kind of anecdotal evidence so far from what we've done. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about is topography-guided LASIK and PRK, which we've also started doing here with the Wavelight Allegretto XMR laser. Um, so the topography-guided LASIK, TCAT, was approved in 2013 and, and has become more widespread early this year. Um, and then just a few weeks ago, topography-guided PRK was also approved with this laser. Um, so the difference compared to wavefront optimized which the prior treatment was based primarily on refraction and treating the sphere and cylinder. And they've, they've kind of changed, Alcon's kind of changed what the way that they think about this recently, but they're saying that now the treatment, which is based on refraction and corneal topography, is more thinking about treating sphere and higher order aberrations because they say that the higher order aberrations affect the amount of of cylinder that patients are taking in their refraction. And so, in a number of patients, and I'll show an example in a minute here, they're, 
the amount of cylinder is quite different from what they have in their refraction that we're actually treating. So this, this is how the procedure works. There's a topolizer, which is a placido disc topographer, basically. Um, and we take a number of pictures on a, a single day for the treatment eye. Um, and using these pictures, which it also has iris registration, so when you're applying the treatment, it stays on the correct axis. Um, it, we create a composite image using at least four separate images of the cornea that are similar. Um, and then that's sent to a planning software and it's, it's a, quite a bit more complex process for planning the treatment compared to wait for an optimize. Um, and then that's sent to the XMR laser the, after the treatment's planned. So who might benefit from this treatment? So the definitely normal eyes with higher order aberrations, especially coma, can benefit from this. And it's approved for for LASIK for up to eight diopters of myopia or up to nine diopters which with three or less diopters of astigmatism and it you can't actually program more than this into the laser it won't let you do the treatment um, but it can be useful f potentially for a regular astigmatism eyes that have already had a refractive procedure or patients who had a previous decentered ablation or small optical zones and then like we talked about post cross-linking this is this is going to likely be a good option. So here's an example of one of the treatments that we planned recently here. Um, so you can see this patient has kind of asymmetric astigmatism and some, some changes superiorly here. Um, down in the left, this is the wavefront optimized ablation pattern. And, and with this treatment, we're, we're treating a little bit of sphere and just a half diopter of cylinder. When we planned this with the topography guided treatment though, the amount of cylinder went up pretty dramatically from a half diopter to 1.75 diopters and because this, this is inducing significant coma. Um, and then the thought is because of that, the patient's manifest refraction is different because of the higher order aberrations. So these are some results from the FDA trials for topography-guided LASIK. Um, and so you can see the results are pretty impressive here, better than 90% of a year getting 20-20 vision. And probably the most interesting thing about this is at one year, 30% of patients had an uncorrected visual acuity that was better than their, their preoperative best spectacle corrected visual acuity. And, and more than 10% even gained greater than two, well, at least two lines or more than that. So that's a pretty significant difference. Did you say that was only approved for LASIK? It just got approved for LASIK. <coughs> oh, okay. Yeah, we're actually going to do a study for the, our fellow study for our, probably the next year or two is going to be a comparison of one eye that receives a wavefront optimized treatment, and then the other eye we're going to do a topography guided treatment, and it's hopefully going to be both for PRK and LASIK. We're working on getting the final approval for that right now. Since, uh, since everybody sees patients with dry eyes, you may want to expound a little about when you should use the fitting grass with cyclosporin, without cyclosporin, when do you introduce it? It's worth because a lot of patients are coming, as you say, with advertising in their hands, saying, can I have a big zebra, please? Well, so, so finding, a lot of this is financial, I think, at this point, because they're, they're doing a 30-day free trial for Zydra. We've been using it mostly in patients that have tried Restasis and didn't have good result from the Restasis. And some, I don't, I don't think that we've tried doing both in the same patient, but some people are doing that since they work by a different mechanism. Um, and I think sometimes people that can't afford, they can't afford for stasis for at least doing a trial of the lithograph, but um, the, the insurance coverage for it is variable. We've had, it seems like it's generally fairly expensive, but we've had a couple people that said they paid almost nothing for the lithograph with their insurance. And 
that may change with the beginning of the year. But I, I think we have been doing it fairly early on for for patients after artificial tears and maybe maybe we've even been doing it before plugs in some cases. But I think it depends on the individual patient. Yeah. So the I guess the protocol that I use is. For a patient with dry eye, you know, try artificial tears, fish oil first, fail that, try with stasis, um, then do plugs. Later on, might maybe consider Zydra. Um, Zydra, though, is I think it's going to be, it is going to be like financially driven because it'll depend on their insurance. Um, and the other thing about Zydra is that for most insurances that aren't covering it very well, it's still very expensive. And it's still, you know, stasis is still very expensive. And the thing about stasis is that there's a lot of drops in each little vial that each um, unit, unit dose is actually good for multiple doses, like about three doses of uh, stasis. So, you know, one month supply of stasis can last like, three months or maybe even more. Um, so that really kind of cuts down on the cost. But Zyde, the makers of Zydro were very savvy. So they cut down the number of drops in each vial. There's literally only maybe two and a half drops in each vial, so you cannot reuse it. And what that means is that the one month supply of Zydra is going to be a one month supply of Zydra. Um, so again, if you have someone who maybe has the same, if uh, their insurance has the same price for both Restasis and Zydra, in reality, in, in kind of practical usage, the Restasis is going to be a third of the price of Zydra. So, so Zydra is provided preservative free single vial delivery is my understanding. It is, yeah, just like Restasis is. Right. Yeah. It's preservative free. And yeah. So you know that all these pharmaceutical companies say it's preservative free it's single vial, it is single use uh, vial. So that's where the expense comes in. In my clinic we keep an, an average cost of the drugs that I prescribe. People are asking, you know, how much would this cost me? We should, we should know. Do we know what the month supply of Excitra costs? It's really it's so variable. variable. Again, it's from yeah. zero to like $500 a month. And so let me, for the residents no say, idea. if you're practicing medicine today, and you don't know the cost of the drug you're prescribing, do not prescribe it. Because there's an antibiotic that I can prescribe for a simple infection that will cost you $500 with insurance. And an equally effective one which will cost you $4. Yeah. I mean, and the problem you're in my job, really know these things. If you ever come to my clinic in the cupboard where the technician said open it, and there are costs of all the topical <coughs> drops, the yeah, steroid drops, antibiotic drops, and a few more on antibiotics there. And I would urge you to carry that in your pocket. I think that should be the 2016 way of being a physician these days. So I think it's around zero to 500. We need a better idea from our pharmacy for what Exactly. Yeah, but the problem is that the insurance companies are so variable that that really is the price, zero to 500. I mean, yeah. depending on the insurance, so there's absolutely no way, and then I'm not going to sit there and look up their insurance and look up what um, the price of the Zydra is. Unfortunately, it's kind of the onus is now on the patient to look into it themselves. I'm not even sure that you can. Yeah, it's so impossible. Yeah. The number of insurance companies. Yeah. When you get some that are, you know, common, then we can kind of figure that out. But I think a lot of the insurances are still figuring out how they're going to cover this drug. I mean, it's only it's only a couple months since it's been out in January. Sometimes the patients are the first one who's tried it in the area. 